Our next speaker is actually Professor John Long. Uh, John graduated with a PhD from Monash University in 1984. He spent six years as a postdoc uh, researcher in paleontology at University in Canberra, Perth, as a fellow in Tasmania, before being appointed as a curator of vertebrate paleontology at the Western Australian Museum in 1989. Now, in 2004, John returned to Melbourne as the new Head of Sciences for Museum Victoria and in 2009 was appointed as Vice President, Research and Collections at the Los Angeles County Museum uh, of Natural History. So in December 2012, he became Strategic Professor in Paleontology at Flinders University, Adelaide. John's research focuses on the early evolution of vertebrates, fishes, as applied to how hu the human body plan was assembled. So today, he will be discussing on the early evolution of sex as told through the fossil record. So John, please. Hello, I would also like to thank the organizers for inviting me here from Australia. Um, my wife and I have had a wonderful couple of days in Singapore and we're really, really enjoying it. And it makes you think about evolution as not just about animals and plants evolving different uh, shapes and forms and bones. Sorry, can we have my talk up here, please? Um, sorry, I just, I might get um, someone to help for a minute. Uh, yeah. So yeah, evolution is not just about looking at um, the way things change and mutate. It's also about the way patterns evolve through time. Uh, I'm a paleontologist, so I look at fossils. Fossils are the remains of life on the planet. Um, over the past 500 million years or so, we can see that fishes have had a very complicated and interesting evolutionary sequence. Thank you. So I'm talking about sex. Uh, when you go out in the field and you find a fossil, you never know what you're going to actually find. Sometimes you find a fossil that's a new species or a, new, a skeleton of something interesting. And fossils generally just represent the bones that give you the physical shape of a prehistoric animal or something that was once alive on the planet. Sometimes, though, you find very rare instances, you get an insight into behavior. So um, the origin of sex is something that, up until recently, fossils have not been very informative to tell us about. But just in the last five or six years, there's been some quite remarkably important discoveries that have filled in the gaps when some of these great big steps of evolution took place. So for a start, all life requires reproduction for species to survive. And I think that's a given. I think we all understand that. When we look at a fossil uh, and we look at the shape of the skeleton, the bones, sometimes in really rare cases, we get this rare moment of a piece of behavior, a piece of what was this animal actually doing 100 million years ago. And here we see the remains of an ichthyosaur, a marine reptile that lived in the seas about 120 million years ago. And fossils are the prime evidence. They're the data, the hard data, that we reconstruct the sequence of how life changed over time and diversified into the many species that inhabit the planet today. And extremely well-preserved fossils are the most wonderful treasures we can find because instead of just being a crushed or damaged or difficult to interpret fossil, we see something very clearly that gives us a window into ancient behavior. Now what we're looking at there is an ichthyosaur that became fossilized or trapped by a sediment flow the moment it gave birth. So we actually see the baby coming out of the female there. That's a 180 million year old specimen from Germany, from the Holzmarden. And basically, this poor mother died during the act of giving birth and was fossilized. So there we have it, that, that moment in time trapped from 180 million years ago. So reproduction can be asexual. A number of primitive organisms breed si simply through making a clone of themselves. Um, for example, hydras and some of the early jellyfish-like animals, the cylindrates. This is a, a sort of advantage for a primitive organism. It uses a lot less energy and it's very low risk. Uh, but you're passing on 100% of your genetic material to your offspring. The disadvantages are that you have a very uniform gene pool 
and this is not good. If a disease or a pathogen comes through that is uh, susceptible to the group, then you're likely to wipe out the whole population. Sexual reproduction is, of course, when you have two parents that share the genetic material to create a slightly different offspring which has a mixed amount of genes from both parents. Um, the disadvantage, of course, is that it's high energy, there's a lot more risk, there's a lot more behavioural modifications involved uh, to reproduce successfully this way. Um, and of course, only 50% of the genetic material is shared. This, of course, is how most vertebrates or backboned animals reproduce on land. We all reproduce sexually. When we look at the fossil record, do we find out any information about the oldest time when, when sex first occurred? And it, there is some wonderful fossils in South Australia, where I live at the moment, in the Ediacara Hills. They're actually the oldest multicellular or metazoan fossils preserved anywhere on the planet. There's a great diversity of them. They date about 560 million years ago. That's before what we call the Cambrian explosion, when life suddenly appeared uh, 540 million years ago, where all the major groups of animals that we know today, such as the crustacean-type arthropods, the worms, uh, the, and all the other groups of echinoderms, and all the major phyla, if you like, the major groups of living organisms appeared about 540 million years ago. Before that, though, we had this very strange community of jellyfish-like and worm-like creatures called the Ediacaran fauna. Now, a couple of good colleagues of mine, Jim Galing and Mary Drosa, just discovered uh, a population of these organisms that were all different sizes on the same bedding plane. And basically what this uh, inferred that you had a whole bedding plane of all these tubular organisms all exactly the same size. And then another site where they were all another size. And another site where they were a slightly different size. And what they found accidentally was that this was evidence of sexual reproduction. Because this is equivalent to a spawning event. Like when corals spawn under a full moon, there's a mass spawning event. They shed uh, their, their gametes into the water, the male and female sex cells join, and then you have a whole population that settles down and grows new corals all at the same time. So if the Ediacaran fossils weren't reproducing sexually, you'd find them at all different sizes. Instead, we find them all one uniform size. So this was published in Science only in 2010 as the very first evidence in the fossil record of sexual reproduction of any kind of organism. Truly amazing stuff. In terms of actual evidence of sexual organs and reproductive structures, we have this amazing little fossil creature called an ostracod, which is one of the bivalve crustacean-like animals. Um, and this one dates back 430 million years old to the Silurian period. And David Civiter, a paleontologist in Britain, actually put these tiny little fossils through a, a micro CT scanner to get amazing three-dimensional structures inside the, the organism while it was still trapped in the rock. And from that, he discovered that this little fellow had a very large male sexual organ. And he actually named it Colimbo Cython Explecticos, meaning the swimmer with the large, large male organ. And it was published in Science as the earliest evidence of actual a male fossil organ. And we are going to get to females as well in this talk, so just bear with me. It's not all about male organs. OK, so let's get back to the principles of vertebrate reproduction so you can understand where I'm coming from when we talk about some of these fossil discoveries. So we've established so far that all vertebrates reproduce sexually by male and females sharing their, their sex cells. But the vast majority of fishes today reproduce through spawning. And that is when the, the males uh, will shed sperm over the females' eggs that are already put into the water. So this is called, naturally enough, an external kind of fertilization. It doesn't happen within the female's body. And the trout, the salmon, nearly all these fish behind us that we see have this kind of external spawning. Um, there's about 13 families, though, of the Telios, this group which Dr. Ventikash explained so beautifully and eloquently the, the behavior of the seahorse. Um, and there are some that do internal fertilization, um, and I'll get to them in a minute. The other group that all have internal fertilization are a much more primitive on the evolutionary scale group, and they're called the sharks or the chondrichthians, the, the cartilaginous fishes. We can see some marvelous examples behind us here. The stingrays, the sharks, 
And when you look at the pelvic fins, the paired fins at the back of the fish, the males have very long lobes called claspers, and the females lack those organs. So if you have a look, you'll probably see one, or I'll point one out when they, they go by. You'll see on the pelvic fin uh, these very large lobes called claspers. So that's so that the male shark can place a package of sperm inside the female where they can either develop as large eggs or oviviparous reproduction, where they lay large eggs that hatch. Or in some cases, they nurture the young inside them and then the female will give birth to her pups. And this can range from just a few pups to as many as, say, 300. A whale shark was once recorded as giving birth to 300 pups. So that's a lot of uh, large little whale sharks to give birth to in one go. So my question I want to address tonight to you all is when and how did complex mating behavior first evolve? Not just spawning in water, which is pretty, pretty easy to do, but for fish to actually get together and for a male to actually get close enough to a female and become intimate and deposit sperm inside her is a very complex set of behavior, not only in terms of physical behavior, but also the whole uh, change of the um, behavior, the, the, the pheromone, the, sorry, the hormones in the system, the change of the internal anatomy as well. When did this first evolve? Do we have any evidence in the fossil record? And secondly, can fossils ever shed light on this problem of when did sex first evolve? So there's a picture of the shark showing the clasper and not just yet, but keep watching and you're bound to see one go past in a minute. Okay, before I go into the fossils, I just want to point out about the living fishes have a very bizarre world of sex. Uh, it's not all straightforward, as you might think. Um, a couple of examples, we've already heard the wonderful example of how complicated seahorse uh, reproduction is, and the males carrying the young in brooding pouches and so on. But in terms of actually mating, some of these teleos, like mandarin fish, they actually clasp and hug each other together to maximize fertilization when they, uh, the female sheds the eggs, the male sheds the sperm at the same time. So it's almost like an intermediate form of internal fertilization, but not quite. Perhaps one of the really bizarre ones are the deep sea anglerfish, where they live in deep oceans where it's dark, um, and the females are very large. The males are tiny. They're about 1 20th or 1 50th the size of the female. The, the arrow there shows you a male attached to the female's head. And they become parasitic. So the male degenerates and just becomes nothing more than ver more or less a bag of sperm. And he attaches himself to the female, gets all his nutrition through being parasitic on the female. And the female can draw on that resource to fertilize her eggs whenever she feels like it. And more than that, she can have more than one male. She can have several of them attached all over her. The difficulty here is the mating process. I mean, how do anglerfish even find themselves in the deep, dark oceans is a, is a mystery to me. Many of you probably keep aquariums, and you probably have these beautiful little fish called bronze catfish, bronze corridorus. They actually live in the Amazon basin. They have a very bizarre method of, of reproduction where the male will lay flat, on the sea, on the floor of the, the river. They live in fast flowing rivers, by the way. And the female will align her mouth to the genital duct of the male, take the sperm into her mouth cavity, and through ducts, they'll eventually find their way into the ovary. They do this because it's much easier to control where the sperm goes rather than a fast flowing stream having it all lost down the riverbed. So this is a form of internal fertilization by very bizarre behavior. So I'm just giving you a, a taste of some fish have very, very strange sexual habits and we have to understand this when we go back to the fossils and try and interpret them. So I'm going to give you a bit of a, a quick refresher course about some of the earliest stages of fish evolution for those of you that haven't heard this story. So the very, very first fossil fishes evolved from simple jawless fish, like we call them agnatha, meaning no jaws. And we have uh, two big steps, really. We have the first step, the origin of jawed forms, and I'm going to talk about placoderms, an extinct group of jawed fish in a minute. And then to the modern groups of fishes, the bony fish, the osteichthys, which Dr. Vendikesh explained beautifully and gave us some very good examples of, of the different groups of those bony fish. But it all started back about 520 million years ago with this fish found in the Burgess Shale of British Columbia called Metasprigina. 
And as you can see, it's a, it's a wormy-like fish, but it does have gill pouches, it's got well-developed eyes, and it's got a W-shaped myotomes or muscle bands. Um, whether you call it a fish or not, who knows? It, it's like a fish. I actually personally like to call the very first fish when bone appears, because bone is a defining tissue of vertebrates. Nonetheless, this was published in Nature by Karine and uh, Simon Como Morris as probably the world's oldest fish uh, in 2014. So if we look at the most primitive living fishes, if you want to actually, again, call them fishes, we have the hagfish and the lamprey, which are parasitic, eel-like fish. They lack fins, they lack paired fins, they lack jaws and teeth, and they're very, very primitive. Um, they spawn in water, although we're not exactly sure about hagfish, we, we guess they spawn, but we know lampreys definitely spawn in water and have different phases of their lifestyle where they live as a larvae buried in the stream, filter feeding, or then they go out to sea and then eventually they come back. So the earliest fossil fish with bone uh, are very simple tubes of fish, fusiform fish that have bony skeletons covered in big, thick, bony scales. We call this dermal bone. It's derived from the skin, the dermis. And the oldest fish, strangely enough, that has this bone, 480 million years ago, comes from central Australia, in the middle of the desert of Australia. Because 480 million years ago, Australia had a giant inland sea cutting it right in half. And these oldest fish in the world have been found there. So they had bone, but they had no jaws, they had no teeth, they had no fins that were paired, and they certainly had no evidence of an internal skeleton. When we look at a, a radiation of these jawless ancient fish, there's many different kinds. And I'm not going to dwell on them, they, they all have big long names, but basically they, they don't look very different. It's, until you get to the advanced forms at the top of this slide, you start to see the first really big breakthrough on the assembly of the human body plan. Now, just to sidetrack for a minute, I like to look at fish and study ancient fish because 90% of the human body plan evolved in fish. Absolutely all the things that we have from a skull to jaws to teeth, paired limbs at the front, hind limbs at the back, vertebrae, pelvic, all of that stuff first evolved in fishes before they left the water. And then the rest of evolution is just fine tuning of that body plan. No major innovations, just fine tuning of the big innovations that all came along in fishes. So that's the way I like to look at it. It's a bit of a different perspective, but it works for me. So if we look at this model, and we look at those fish at the top, the osteostracans, they're the first fish to have paired limbs at the front. So arms came before legs. Paired pectoral fins appeared in these jawless fishes well before the hind limbs or the pelvic fins appeared. First paired fins. Now, the placoderms are one of the most interesting groups of extinct fishes you can ever come across. It's my mission in life that everybody should know what a placoderm is. Hands up, anyone here that actually before now has heard of a placoderm? I always do this, so I'm always amazed to see, anyone heard of a placoderm? All right, one, two, three, four, there's maybe four or five people out of 200 people in this room that have heard of placoderms. Yet placoderms rule the oceans, the rivers, the lakes of the world as the dominant vertebrates on Earth for 70 million years, yet most of you have never heard of them. Placoderms gave us jaws, they gave us teeth, they gave us paired hind limbs, they gave us three semicircular canals in our ear, they gave us the first skulls with paired plates, like pari frontal parietal kind of plate arrangements on the skull. They gave us many things for the first time that then continued right through to the rest of evolution to us humans, and yet most of us haven't heard of placoderms. Well, there is a very primitive group of shark-like fishes that had thick bony plates. Placoderm simply means plated skin. And these big thick bony plates mesh together to form a covering around the fish. They went extinct about 360 million years ago, so there's none of them around today, but all of us are in a way part placoderm because we're, we're their, their ancestors of, of, of all of us in one way. So there's some examples of some beautifully preserved fossil placoderm uh, skeletons from the Devonian period. Now when we look at fossils that are 400 million years old, they're generally pretty well squashed and flat and ugly things to interpret. But there are just a couple of sites in the world where you get pristine three-dimensional fossils of this age. And one of them is a site I'll talk about in a minute called Gogo in the Kimberley of Australia. 
And that's where the fish with the red background at the top right of your screen, it's the perfect jaws, it's got the eye bones, you can open and close the mouth, you can move the neck up and down. Yet that's a 380 million year old fossil, jaw, uh, fossil specimen there. But I'll show you more about that site in just a minute. Let's first of all talk a little bit about the diversity of these placoderms. There's about seven major groups of placoderms and today I'm just going to talk about three of them. And I want you to try and remember these three names because they're not big names but they're, they're pretty easy to remember. So we have a group, the most dominant of all placoderms, and they're simply called the arthrodires. And this comes from the Greek, it just means joint neck, because they had a well-developed neck joint where they could move the skull up and down on a ball and socket type of, type of neck joint. Some of the arthrodires were huge in size. I mean, if I just go back to this slide, the, the picture of the one on the left down below is a thing called Dunkelosteus. Its lower jaw is a meter long. This was the first mega predator on Earth. It reached probably sizes of seven to eight meters in length. In fact, my calculation, based on all the jaw bones of it I've measured, I come up with 7.7 .7 meters in length. Far bigger than a great white shark today, for example. So they were the first big fish. Prior to them, there were no fish more than about half a meter in length. So placoderms were the first jawed vertebrates to, to also reach really big sizes. The other groups that are interesting for today's talk is a little group called the Tictodonts, and they're short, deep-bodied placoderms that um, have powerful crushing tooth plates. So they're al already showing that by the Devonian period, placoderms weren't just one sort of body shape or one size or, or one sort of niche. They also had durophagus jaws, jaws that could crush up clams and coral and hard things. They were starting to specialize into many different niches on the ancient reefs. But the most bizarre, I think, of all of these ancient placoderms have to be a group called the Antiarchs. And they're weird because when they were first found as fossils, people thought they were fossil turtles or fossil crustaceans like crabs. They have bony arms with bone around the outside and muscles on the inside. So next time you have a, a beautiful Singapore chili crab and you break open the leg and you pull out the delicious meat, that's what you could have done with an Antioch. They had the bone on the outside, the meat on the inside. Now up until 10 years ago, biologists were not interested in placoderms at all. But then again, I like to think of placoderms as like dinosaurs. Up until about 20 to 15 years ago, most biologists weren't interested in dinosaurs. They just thought, oh, dinosaurs, they're a dead end. What can we learn from dinosaurs? And then when the beautiful transition of feathered dinosaurs and then to early birds was found through the downing sequences of China, suddenly biologists became interested in dinosaurs because dinosaurs could inform us about bird evolution and bird origins and all of these amazing evolutionary transitions. And now it's still a very hot topic to study those, those feathered dinosaurs. Well, placoderms have gone through a renaissance in the last five years because only in 2013, this amazing fish at the top was discovered in China called Antilonathus. And it was the first time a placoderm has been found that had a complex lower jaw. In fact, his lower jaw is more like a tetrapod, like a land animal than like any other kind of fish. And it suddenly was the missing link we were all after. I, I like to call it the Archaeopteryx of the Devonian because to me it's the most important fossil found in the last hundred years that fills in the biggest gap of evolution than anything else. Forget your fossil humans, forget your dinosaurs, this fish filled in the biggest gap because it actually linked placoderms as an extinct boring group to us as suddenly placoderms are the ancestors to all of us. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that. But this is how the tree of life is now connected from these early placoderms to bony fish. Uh, Dr. Ventikesh explained about the lobe fin fish, the sarcopterygians. We have fossil forms, and then from them we get the early tetrapods. Now, this next slide shows you another one of these early placoderms from China, from a beautiful site in Yunnan, in um, uh, southern China, at Quan Ti the Quanti formation. These are not only the oldest placoderms known, but they're also some beautiful complete placoderms. And they show us the, the beautiful transition here from all the bones in the jaw of a human can be traced right back now to these bones in the jaws of these ancient placoderms. And we know now that some of the more conventional placoderms, the ones I'm going to show you, have modified, they, they have a much simpler jaw because they haven't got these additional bones that were shared by early tetrapods and eventually, 
by land animals and then later on lost secondarily in reptiles and mammals. So we've gone back. Look at the human at the top. It's got one bone in blue. That's called the dentary. That's your lower jaw. Look at the placoderm down the bottom. It's got one bone in blue, the dentary. So we've gone from evolutionary simplicity here to great complexity and back to simplicity again in this one magnificent sequence. Um, so how do we learn about placoderms? We go out and find them. Paleontology is one of the most exciting sciences to be involved in because we go out in the field every year and we find interesting stuff. So I've been working this site in the Kimberley at GoGo -Go for 31 years. I first went up there in 1986 and that year I spent six weeks in the, this far northern desert of Australia smashing rocks and for every thousand of these rocks you smash you might find one good fossil fish. But why is that important? Because Normally fossil fish are squashed flat, but this site was an ancient barrier reef. It teemed with life. There were a beautiful preservation of corals and marine creatures in this reef. And there's a core of an atoll that was once the, the middle of a, of, a, of a patch reef with the reefs in the background. And you can go to the horizon as far as you can see in every direction. There's no people up here. This is the most least inhabited part of the, the planet, some, some geographers have said. So we find these fish in the field, they look a bit like this, and some of them even look like fish, like the one on the right there. But when we put them in acetic acid, we dissolve the carbonate rock away, and we get these beautiful three-dimensional skulls out. The one on the left is an early lobe fin fish, a predatory fish with large jaws, called Nicodus. The one in the right is a typical arthrodire, or placoderm, which I named McNamara aspis and became famous as being the very first Devonian fish to become a state fossil emblem in Australia. Australia's had a rash of recent fossil emblems named for each of its states. So we have a faunal emblem, a floral emblem, and now we have a fossil emblem to represent the four-dimensional depth of time that helps us understand the environment. So Singapore should get one too. It's a, it's a great, great way for kids to learn about science. Okay, so one of the one of the most exciting things about going into the field is the serendipity of it all. We never know what we're going to find. We find these fish fossils, um, they take a lot of hard work, and then when you find them, you get them back into the lab, and you put them in acetic acid for up to two months, and you slowly dissolve the rock away, and bit by bit, the bones emerge out of the rock, and you're thinking, oh, I wonder what that is. Oh, I think I know what that one is, so you put it aside. And you keep going, I don't know what this one is, so I'll keep going with that. And you go with the mysterious and the enigmatic ones, and that's where the real treasure lies. This particular specimen turned out to be the most exciting discovery of my entire career. Just a small placoderm fish, but with a little bit more work, we ended up finding uh, the tail. You know, the, the tail is often not preserved in these nodules. It sort of erodes away. But this one has the whole of the tail with all the vertebrae preserved. And there's the axis of the tail shown with those big large plates at the top being part of the uh, shoulder girdle of the placoderm. But as we prepared it out, we found a number of very tiny little bones preserved in this area of the fish that we couldn't quite figure out what they were. So eventually we figured it out. They were an embryo. They were an unborn baby placoderm inside a mother fish. And so these show you some of the jaws that are still articulated, the upper and the lower jaws. There are some of the bony plates there that form the skull, but we also have a mineralized umbilical cord. We get soft tissue preserved in some of these absolutely fantastic fossils. The original soft tissue gets eaten away by bacteria, so you get a, a ghosting, if you like, of some of the soft tissue reproduced by these, these bacterial trails. So let me take away those arrows and show you um, this thing. We made a CT scan synchrotron movie of it, and if it'll just play, uh, come on, played before, uh-oh, not going to play for some reason, <laughs> never mind, it just rotates, but basically you can see from that image, you can see the curly uh, umbilical cord wrapping around, uh, stuck in the rock there. Okay, so this fossil turned out to be a completely new species to science. And uh, from GoGo -Go now, we've discovered about 30 new species, actually, so we get to name them all the time. And this particular one was such an exciting find, I, I had to name it 
the mother fish, Martapisis, so that, that's what it's called. And for the species name, I named it after Sir David Attenborough, so I called it Martapisis Attenborough Eye. And um, Sir David was really excited to see this fish when I explained it to him and to have it named after him and also to have the origin of sex named after him because when we found the fish, we didn't realise till about a month later that we hadn't just found the oldest fossil embryo of any, any vertebrate fossil, but it meant these fish were, were actually having sex. They were having internal fertilisation and this was absolute undeniable proof of it. Furthermore, we went back to the drawing board. When you make a discovery in science, you think, well, there should be more of them. There won't just be one. So some of the earlier fossils I'd prepared out for my first go-go trip in 86, I went back, I woke up in a, in a sweat one Saturday morning, remembering that I'd seen some more of these strange clusters of little bones, but not knowing what they were. So I went back to this specimen, and lo and behold, not just one, not just two, but three complete embryos, complete skeletons of embryonic fish inside this other mother. So we then ended up finding a number of these specimens with the complete embryos. Let's drill down and have a look at what one of those little embryos look up, looks like up close. You can see that everything from the jaws, the, the plates of the head, the skull, the bones of the trunk, and basically it gives you not only information on what the embryo was like before it was born, the nature of early dermal bone tissues before they're actually formed in utero, uh, and also the changing scale of bones, the what we call ontogeny. If you look at a baby human to an adult human, we have totally different proportions, you know, longer bodies, bigger heads, smaller limbs, all that sort of thing. Placoderms are the same. In fact, all vertebrates undergo changes with growth, and the ontogeny gives us a, a bit of a clue as to what the more primitive condition might be like in some of these placoderms uh, because as you grow your features become more extreme if you like. We even made a movie and uh, hopefully this one will work. <laughs> they, always norm they always work normally these things. Um, oh it's working on the screen. Oh good. So it's not working here that's the thing. <laughs> okay give it a second and see if it works. Start again. There we go. So this shows the features of the embryo inside the mother fossil. And this shows you how it fits into the, uh, what the reconstructed Martapisis look like. And this very simple movie, which lasts for all of about 20 seconds, um, is the first portrayal, if you like, of live birth in a vertebrate, giving birth to its pup. We know the pup came out backwards, not frontwards, because that's the orientation inside the mother of the embryo. So now if we go to uh, the, the most abundant of all these ancient placoderms, the arthrodires, we realised we had a conundrum. We'd found an embryo in this one small group called the tyctodonts, which are not very speciose. There's only about 20 different you know, well-represented species of that group, whereas we had three or four hundred of these arthrodires in museums, collections all around the world. British Museum has got thousands of them, but no, none of them have shown any evidence of embryos or sexual dimorphism. So we'd expect two things. If these fish are having internal fertilisation, then like the sharks behind us, we'd expect to find the males with claspers or clasper-like organs and the females with a different kind of morphology in that pelvic fin area. So some of these beautiful go-go um, fish, by the way, um, we've even identified muscles on them, including um, transverse abdominal muscles across the belly. And we used to think, that's really unusual because no living fish has transverse abdominal muscles or a six-pack like James Bond has. But these placoderms do, which is not to be expected in a primitive fish. But now we realise these transverse muscles are probably to move claspers. And I'll get to that. I'm jump jumping ahead of my story here. So if we look at this other fish from Gogo called Incisus scutum, which is very well preserved, it's one of my early drawings of it. Basically, inside two specimens at the British Museum of Natural History in London, we were able to find clusters of embryonic bones. So for the first time, this was the identity of embryos inside this major group of placoderms. And, you know, this is a pretty big deal. It resulted in a, a paper being published in Nature. We found two, two examples of these embryos. The evidence of these embryos showed that the arthrodires, the largest group of all placoderms, reproduced by internal fertilisation. 
But despite hundreds and hundreds or thousands of these specimens in museums, we still hadn't found the male or the female. So we didn't know, you know, how were they doing it? You know, how the heck were they doing it is the question. So again, in science, you go back to the drawing board, you go back and look through all the collections again. We went to the British Museum, we looked at all the Australian collections in Perth, Canberra, Melbourne, and then we found one. And this was in a, a student's thesis. Uh, it was an amazing piece of work, a specimen that was prepared, uh, showed the pelvic girdle where the pelvic fins attach. And finally, we'd found the clasper, this element, uh, a long element there called a basiterygium, which actually is an element that points backwards off the pelvic fin. Now, this is interesting because you find that in sharks today. And we found it in a couple of other placoderms as well. Here's a pelvic girdle of a, of a fish. It's, this is not well-preserved bone. This is latex rubber making a cast. But nonetheless, you can see uh, there's a long structure coming off the back of the fin there that's pointing away from the back of the fish, which looks a bit like a clasper. So that was the first evidence of this element called, well, we called it the basiterygium originally, but now we know we're calling it the metaterygium. It's just another anatomical term for a bone in the pelvic girdle. Uh, but at the end of it was a, a smooth facet, which must have been for another cartilage, which wasn't mineralized. So we believe that was circumstantial evidence for a possible clasper in these fish. Um, a good friend of mine, an artist in Australia, got excited by this and did this beautiful artistic reconstruction showing how some of these flat placoderms called philolepids, which are a bit like the flounder or the soul of the placoderm world, they were very flattened fish that lived on the bottom of the sea. Eventually, we did find the clasper, and it looks surprisingly like the pelvic girdle. So if you take this element and you fit it onto the pelvic girdle, we did something that many scientists do, but we shouldn't do, is we made an assumption. We made an assumption that they were like sharks and that the clasper must fit to the pelvic girdle as they do in modern sharks. So that was our very first attempt to reconstruct what the sexual organs were like in this major group of placoderms. Recent work, though, by my colleagues, Kate Schneistrick at Curtin University and Zarina Johansson at the British Museum of Natural History, and myself, we went back and we looked at all of these collections again, and we identified these claspers in all the common species that were already there under the noses of the, the scientists in the British Museum, and yet we were able to identify these claspers of these small elements. The interesting thing about this is that we never found any of these claspers actually attached to the pelvic girdle. They were always separate. And then we realized the assumption we'd made that they were like sharks was totally wrong. Even though we'd published it in Nature in 2009, we came up with a completely new interpretation. And this is the beauty of science. You can make mistakes. The best thing is when you get to correct your own mistakes rather than someone else corrects them, it's, it's really sweet. So what we're able to do then is identify that this is what it's really like with placoderms. They have a pectoral girdle at the front with the pectoral fins. They have a pelvic girdle with the pelvic fins. And behind that, the males have a clasping organ and the females have an internal basal plate that protects the eggs. And basically, um, that's developed along the same way as limbs are developed. Uh, Zarina Johansson believes that these sexual organs are actually like orthologs of paired limbs because they have dermal bone and endochondral bone, sort of perichondral bone components to them, exactly like the limb girdles in the pectoral and pelvic girdle. So we published this in 2015 that perhaps the earliest vertebrates had three pairs of limbs, not two. But the most serendipitous and last of these discoveries about placoderm sex came when I was in the beautiful medieval wall town of Tallinn in Estonia in late 2013. I was working with one of the great gurus of uh, Estonian paleontology, the late Elga Mark Kurik. She, she passed away last year, aged 86, but she worked with most of the Soviet Russia collections of Devonian fish uh, for many, many years. And she had co collections from all over Siberia, from all over Latvia and Estonia, Lithuania, everywhere. And while I was working there on a project with her on placoderms, she gave me a shoebox with some small bones in them. And I looked at this one element there, and I thought, um, oh, this is amazing. This is truly extraordinary. What we've got here is another group of placoderms that we didn't think even had pelvic fins, 
and yet we've got a, what I think is a clasper and long tube element coming off it. Let me explain a bit more clearly. This is the Antiarchs, the group with the strange bony arms I talked about before. And if you turn one of those fellows overneath and look at the belly view on the bottom right, you'll see what I've called the PVL plates, that's posterior ventrolateral plates. Normally they just end in a, in a very boring kind of way, but sometimes we found a plate with this extra bone attached to it, and that made me think that this must have been a clasper. And originally, by comparing it with the claspers of other placoderms, we were able to sort of suggest that maybe these most primitive of all placoderms also had a, a complex form of sexual reproduction. So eventually some specimens turned up from Scotland that had complete examples of these fish with the claspers. So we went back, I had two expeditions back to the Orkneys of northern Scotland, and with these fine gentlemen from, uh, from Scotland and, and Britain, we, we collected a lot more s examples of these fish. And then we discovered that the claspers on these ancient placoderms, they look like the feet. They're big hooked structures on the males, and we even have some of them being partly developed. Sexually immature males, if you like, have small claspers that get much larger um, with maturity. For the first time, we also found evidence of female diversity, that the females had additional small plates that we, we call these female genital plates that were there probably to aid the male in mating and to hold that clasper in position. But we also solved a mystery because we didn't know for, for many, many years, we wondered what these bony arms were for on these fish. And people used to you know, hypothesize that they were for walking out of water or, or different strange reasons. But Finally, we figured it out. They were for mating. That's the only purpose they could serve. So we figured it out that basically these fish interlocked and they had a side-by-side -side mating posture. And this is the earliest type of mating position in any vertebrate. It made huge news at the time. It was in the, all over the news, the BBC, the newspapers. Um, there were some very strange headlines in the media, but these were some of them. Um, it was on not the nine o'clock news, the BBC, it was on QI with Stephen Fry, and it was on the um, Saturday, Saturday Night Live in the US. Three of the biggest comedy shows in the world chose to make fun of this particular discovery, but we don't mind. So Flinders University invested in another movie, and now we get to show you what the earliest reproductive act of any vertebrate was probably like. So there's the male on the left, uh, Microbrachius dickii was named after Robert Dick, Scottish paleontology uh, collector. Tiny little fish, these are only six centimetres in length. The skeletons are quite small. You see how the quality of the animation's gone up since the 2008 animation I showed you of the mother fish. This was done by an animated company in uh, Adelaide, three, um, yeah, by, by some young animators. So there's the male mating with the female, interlocking those little bony arms, and we believe that is the only purpose of those particular arms. The most interesting thing about this discovery, though, was something that we hadn't seen coming. We thought that, all right, we've discovered the origin of internal fertilization at the bottom of the vertebrate tree, but what we didn't realize, that if placoderms are the ancestors to us all, as was established by this recent work in China, we now have to do something that was thought impossible in biology. We have to have a reversal. We go from spawning in water, external fertilization, to primitive internal fertilization, and then somewhere along the way, we have to go back to spawning in water. But as Dr. Ventikes showed us with the loss of some of these genes, many of these complex uh, systems in evolution can be reversed, like the loss of pelvic fins, for example, is not too difficult. So we believe this is just uh, another way of uh, reinventing mating in a different way in the, in the teleos fish and the bony fish. So these arrows point to all the, the reversals in evolution of uh, loss of claspers and internal fertilization and then regaining it again in some of those lineages secondarily. So internal fertilization must have evolved several times within vertebrates. If we look at living uh, land vertebrates, like, like reptiles, in some reptiles we see that viviparity or live birth has evolved independently up to 140 times in different lineages. And that's been published by Daniel Blackburn in some of his recent reviews of reptile um, evolution and viviparity. So we know that 
you can change your reproductive style many times in evolution and this is, this is evidence of it. The question begs though, how did internal fertilization first begin in vertebrates? Now we've had some strange ideas. I said before we used to make assumptions, like if we saw that uh, the pelvic girdle looked a bit like a shark, then we'll reconstruct it like a shark. Later we were wrong. So when vertebrates first evolved jaws, like placoderms, what were the jaws for? Well, you're all going to say for eating, of course. Maybe not. When you look at the way sharks mate, they use their jaws uh, for copulation because they have to get a grip on the female to get purchase to place the clasper inside the female. So what they do is they bite the pectoral fin, hold on tight, and then entwine. And basically, why not? Maybe jaws could have evolved for reproduction rather than feeding. Who knows? Or maybe both at the same time. We'll probably never resolve that, but it's fun having a bit of a guess and uh, putting it out there. Now, the work of the molecular and evolutionary developmental biologists is is critical to understanding what these fossils mean to evolution. Um, in the old days, we used to look at fossils and look at patterns of bones and think, we can make a story out of this. Now it's much better. And Dr. Ventercash's wonderful talk before sort of showed the complexity of genes and the double genome effects and all of this. And now we know that a lot of these genes uh, are really important for the development of these clasping organs and different genetic circuits and pathways have recently been identified. If we look at, say, the skate, Lucaraja, we now know, for example, that the male developed these big, long claspers on the left, and the female also has clasper cartilages, but they just don't develop. So they have the same developmental pathway, but they stop the development at a certain time. Um, but more importantly, if we look at um, the way mammals and placoderms and, and some of these early sharks develop their, their patterning genes, Hox D13, for example, builds claspers in sharks and limbs, plus genital organs and limbs in mammals. So we have a link here that actually shows the same developmental process for developing the claspers in these ancient fish is important for developing limbs and the genital plate in mammals. Now, what's this got to do with placoderms? Well, remember I said before that we think the placoderms developed the genital organs as an extra set of limbs? Well, here's a gene that illuminates limbs and genital organs together, indicating they probably had a deep and similar evolutionary origin. And I ran this by Marty Cohen, who's one of the, the gurus of this area, and he was very excited and agreed with me that this is possible explanation for this, this phenomena. So to summarize, we have an interesting and complex evolution of sexual reproduction and sexual organs in vertebrates. Uh, the placoderms in the light blue down below are the first to experiment and diversify with different stages and different kinds of internal fertilization. Sharks developed a completely different way where they actually developed claspers from the pelvic girdle. They weren't part of the pelvic girdle in placoderms. And then later on in the teleos, we get secondary kinds of internal fertilization developing. Guppies, for example, can use a modified anal fin spine off the anal fin to transfer sperm to the female. It's not a clasper, it's a singular organ, it's just a developed fin spine that's modified. And then eventually, when you get to the lower terrestrial vertebrates, we get paired sexual organs, hemipenes, in many of the snakes and some of the lower um, Sicilians and amphibians and so on. Others don't have sexual organs at all, like frogs. So again, there's a lot of diversity and disparity there. Eventually, Birds and crocodilians, or a group we call the archosaurians, that also includes dinosaurs, are the first to have a, a single male organ or penis developed for reproduction. And that carries right through from birds to mammals, uh, and presumably dinosaurs reproduce the same way, but we don't know. We, we simply don't know how dinosaurs reproduced. Apart from some of the eggs in some of the oviducts indicate they laid two eggs at a time, similar to crocodiles and not just other dinosaurs like sauropods, big, big brontosaurus-like things laid lots of eggs at once. So there's even different messages from dinosaur paleobiology about how they reproduced, but no hard evidence as to actually how they reproduced. So I think I'll leave it at that. Um, sexual selection is another area of evolution that Darwin was very fond of talking about. And uh, we could go into that, but that, that's a, another whole lecture. It, it's fascinating stuff. 
If you do want to read more about this, though, I did write a book called The Dawn of the Deed, which gives you the whole complete prehistory of sex. Uh, and my book on the rise of fishes just gives you a, a background of fish evolution. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you.